autoimmune conditions are complex disease states where inflammatory and immune dysregulation overwhelm numerous regulatory systems. Their development and severity are often influenced by a legion of factors including genetics, immune dysregulation and infections, intestinal hyperpermeability, dysbiosis and toxicity, nutritional deficiencies and stress. Bioceuticals is proud to present the Reprogramming Autoimmunity Seminar Series in November 2016. The aim of this seminar is to delve deep into the known imbalances seen in autoimmune diseases and to learn the modern integrative treatments which can improve the health of patients suffering autoimmune-related illness. You will leave this seminar confident in assessing the complex imbalances seen in various autoimmune disorders, prescribing safe herbal and nutritional medicines to combat immune imbalances, and recommending effective nutritional and lifestyle interventions for the management of autoimmune disease symptoms. Your presenter, Belinda Reynolds, is a dietitian and senior educator for Bioceuticals who has shared her wealth of knowledge across Australia and New Zealand. Join Belinda at this half-day seminar throughout November 2016 to learn more about the evidence-based approaches for rebalancing immune dysregulation and how to enable your patients to enjoy a more fruitful life. Register now for this important education event at bioceuticals.com.au slash education slash events. FX Medicine, and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining me on the line today from Sydney is Clint Patterson. In 2006, Clint was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and within two years could barely walk, with pain crippling 80% of his body. After surgery and medications failed him, Clint went back to his science roots, which in 2000 saw him gain first-class honours, the Macquarie Foundation Science Prize, Australian Institute of Physics Prize, New South Wales branch, and semi-finalist for the Young Australian of the Year. With bulldog determination, persistence, and scientific experimentation, Clint turned his health around and now leads a drug-free and pain-free life. With the drugs behind him, he is now a proud father of daughter Angelina and a new baby, as well as being a loving husband to gorgeous wife, Melissa. Welcome, Clint, to FX Medicine. G'day. How are you going? (laughs) I'm really well, mate. (laughs) Clint, I've got to say, you have a fantastic and inspiring story, but you've also got an interesting past in comedy, haven't you? So tell us a little bit first about your history. Yeah, I'm very transparent to uh, people who who kind of feel that maybe my comedy background... (laughs) may undermine the sort of professional integrity that I have when I when I coach people with their health with rheumatoid arthritis and other autoimmune diseases because um, it was actually very beneficial to be involved in a, in a job where I only needed to work two nights, sometimes only one night a week because I had all that extra time in my hands to then work on my health. Mm. And this is one thing that I had up my sleeve and it was a, was a great advantage to me uh, compared to a lot of folks who are trying to work on their health because... When you are an entertainer, and as I have been for 16 years, and in the last 10 years, mostly corporate events, um, you um, you know you, you do have that extra time. And mm. I was therefore able to, as you said earlier in your introduction, go back to my science roots and study this disease like it was a second degree. So I've got um, you know a, a very logical, um, my, with a physics background and, and a physics education and degree. I've got a problem solving mindset, and so. Um, I was able to apply more time to try and work out what was causing my pain than I worked than I spent in my entire four years at university. Uh, so it, you know, it took one hell of an effort. But uh, um, you know, there's nothing more important than working on your health. Which came first, the comedy or the science? The science. I did science. I did uh, a bachelor of technology at Macquarie University, and I went through that with a major in physics. But then the degree was actually a, a technology uh, uh, sort of certificate. Um, and then I was working in that environment. I had a hundred staff working under me when I was only twenty-five years old. So I was promoted 
extremely fast in a high tech company and was, you know, a real sort of, uh, you know, successful young corporate businessman working with the uh, high tech fiber optic stuff. Yeah. And, um, and, and then well, in 2000, the, uh, the, uh, anyone who's involved with, uh, uh, the high tech industry and might remember that the NASDAQ and the whole high tech industry collapsed in 2000. And yeah, that's right. And, uh, down went the, uh, share price, uh, uh, so much on our, um, on our company that there was, uh, a huge, uh, huge problem with our business and, and our 380 staff that we had in North Ride in Sydney, um, were all made redundant. So I got, uh, wow. Just shy of sixty thousand tax free dollars, and I thought, well, you know, I'm twenty five. Well, I would have been twenty seven years old, and I also obviously had saved money from the job. And I thought, I'm just going to go and uh, do something entirely different. And I, um, I had a fear of public speaking, so I thought, I'm going to conquer that next. I'm going to get rid of this fear of public speaking, and it became my career. So I got to say, comedy. I mean, you talk about the fear of public speaking. Comedy would have to be how to bash yourself up with a brick with public speaking. <laughs> That would be I the hard I'm ter- I find anything I'm terrified of, and I I go 100 percent at it. So yeah. I was skydiving at the time, <laughs> so I was skydiving and doing stand up comedy, and uh, those uh, two things I think you know enough to get uh, to get the, the heart racing. I just you know full of life, wanted to explore all of my uh, fears and and take them on. So this was about three or four years before, well, probably three yeah three or four years before I got rheumatoid. So. I don't think that was an underlying contributor, but I have many, uh, <laughs> many much more, more, uh, more uh, probable causes uh, yeah. of my disease, yeah, which I can get into uh, in a moment. Can you take our listeners through what were the first symptoms that you started to notice something was wrong? In my feet, I just started to know the little, uh, I didn't even know what they were called at the time, but the, the balls of the feet and metatarsal joints were starting to get inflamed. And for anyone who's, for most people who've never had this disease, it's a very, very unusual. Um, you can tell something's wrong right away when your metatarsals of your feet are inflamed because you've never had pain there before. It's a part of the body that has never created a, a trigger or, or, or an alert. And so when I had pain in those uh, that balls on my feet waking up in the morning and I was in Brisbane doing shows, doing stand-up shows for two weeks up there and I, I was waking up in the morning with these these pains in my feet. And so that, that concerned me, um, but nothing too much because I had always been healthy. I was cross-country champion at uh, at school and I was sports captain at school and sports captain at university in my college. You know, I, I ran the city to surf, the, the, the Sydney race, um, without training uh, in 69 minutes, I was top 5,000 out of the 100,000 races and I hadn't trained in wow. years. So, yeah, I mean, I was fit um, by my own sort of layman's uh, 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 view on myself. Um, and so, yeah, um, you know, I just, uh, yeah, I kind of just sort of forgot my train of thought there. But, but yeah, so, I mean... Uh, well, I got the symptoms in my in my feet and, and didn't think much of it. But then I went and uh, started to uh, get uh, pains in my fingers not long thereafter. Right. And and I was playing a game of touch football. And I remember running onto the field. Gosh, my feet are hurting as I'm running on to play touch football. This isn't right. And in a in a stroke of horrible fate, I actually because um, I hadn't been training, been a long time since I'd run out to play touch football. <laughs> in the week of hell. Uh, I tore my ACL playing touch football in that in that match. So I had I had the pains in my feet the week before. Ran onto the touch field uh, to play touch football. Tore my ACL. Fingers started to hurt, and then I had a, a, a complete tear ACL and, and diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis within a two week period. So it was a horrible, horrible time. And uh, yeah, so um, uh, consequently. The rheumatoid, which does tend to um, like to go to areas of the body that are damaged, uh, really then starts to take hold on my left knee. But it's not like the osteoarthritis wear and tear thing. It's a little bit different, isn't it? Can you explain uh, a little bit about that inflammatory process? Yeah, most definitely. So the way I describe it um, is actually a similar way to one of the first descriptions I ever got from um, the rheumatologist, which said it's actually like multiple sclerosis. So and, and it is that severe. It is something that absolutely destroys your life. It ruins families, relationships. Um, it causes, uh, on average, a 13-year reduction in lifespan. 
um, which I believe uh, is due to the drug use. The disease itself doesn't kill you, and people, um, you know, aren't, you know, their mortality rate itself from the disease is mm. lower. I believe that's from side effects of all of the, uh, uh, the, the, the medications, which are as, as bad as any for any disease on the planet. Well, they're um, often chemotherapeutics. <laughs> They are, and that's, uh, that's right. That's a, a methotrexate, and also, but then you el- escalate beyond that into into uh, these biologic drugs, which yeah, um, labs, yeah. yeah, where where you just you know you don't have to look far into the into the scientific literature to find that some of them increase cancer by three hundred percent. They cause all sorts of uh, additional side effects uh, with regards to picking up infections and. The thing that the drugs themselves cause the immune system to be so depleted that the body can't fight off things that then ultimately cause a mortality. Yeah, so that's yeah. what happens. Yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, but when, with the autoimmune condition, um, the body's attacking itself. As I said, it's severe as a multiple sclerosis, but instead of attacking the nerve endings, uh, it attacks the lining around the joints. And what gets implicated mostly is the, the, is the synovium, the synovial tissue, but you also the, um, the soft tissue around the, around the joint as well, the little connecting uh, ligaments and tendons, they get caught up. There's a whole bunch of swelling that occurs. And the classic photograph of a rheumatoid arthritis hand is one that mm-hmm. the middle knuckles of the, of the fingers are all swollen and it's very hard to create a fist. And these people, you know, they end up... Physical disabilities is common within 10 years. Uh, there's, a, there's a fairly high statistical rate of not being able to complete work, uh, having to get disability, all sorts of stuff. I mean, yeah. it's absolutely shocking. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, one, of, one of my other doctors once said to me, as he was inspecting my knee, when I said it was a rheumatoid arthritis diagnosis recently, he said, of all the diseases I would not want to get, that would be at the top of my list. Really? And that's coming right from the doctor. Yeah. Wow. So that's just to set the scene. And anyone who's listening who's a practitioner and, and has treated someone with rheumatoid arthritis, they'll well appreciate the absolute difficulty in getting positive outcomes and getting improved condition. It is notoriously challenging to treat. And that's that's accepted. That That's accepted by orthodox medicine. It is notoriously mm-hmm. hard to treat. Absolutely. Mm. And I have uh, a podcast of my own, and, and on that podcast I invite uh, doctors who I have... I hold in high regard to come on and they talk about how they treat rheumatoid arthritis and ones that are uh, uh, sympathetic and, and, and use complementary treatments to the ones that I encourage all confide in me and and, uh, and, and openly share how difficult it is to treat. However, it can be treated and, and dramatically improved results can be obtained. But Everything has to be done correctly. Yeah, and, and I think this is the difficult choice, if you like, that that rheumatologists and, and doctors would have in treating RA, specialist first, um, chronic care by the GP, and that is, you know, you're tasked with trying to help somebody through an extremely painful and debilitating disease. So this sort of hard risk-benefit balance of the medications, short, potentially shortening life indeed, versus a short-term um, improvement of, of lifestyle. It's a hard one to make, but sometimes they've got to make that call. You used yes. drugs initially, though, didn't you? But you got a little relief. Is that right? Um, so I want, to make a, I want to talk a lot about what you just said. I'm excited to talk about that. But, yeah, let me just talk about my specific situation mm. first. Mm. I tried for about 12 to 18 months to not go on the medications because I thought, given my history with my health, I mean, I'd never even broken a bone. I, I was the most uh, unperturbed body in terms of no broken bones, no health issues. I mean, I, I, I would, I consider myself extremely healthy prior to prior to getting rheumatoid, and so I thought, if anyone can get through this, I'll be able to. And I had a lot of confidence in my ability, as I said earlier, to solve problems, and I'd always been very successful with my career and I just thought, look, I'll be able to work this out. Mm -hmm. But anyway, within 12 to 18 months, I was a disaster. So I tried various changes to my diet, nothing nothing like what I now recommend because I didn't know the extent of the, the changes you have to make and I didn't know how to get the detail right. But I tried various things. I you know, I took every supplement under the sun. I think I've taken more than 50 different types of supplements. And, and some of these things may have helped. But when you're getting the food wrong, yeah. um, you, you really, you're trying to... 
do everything you know, the hard way. You've yeah. got to have the food right or you're going nowhere with no. even no matter how. You're pushing how a brick uphill, go. aren't you? Yeah. Exactly. That's right. That's right. So with regards to your comments about the drug treatments versus lifestyle changes, there's several several factors at play there when someone first goes to their rheumatologist after they eventually get an appointment probably two to three months after diagnosis by a blood test. And that's because the rheumatologists are all backed up. And this is, I've found, around the world. It's not just in Australia. Around the world, sometimes people are waiting sometimes up to six months to see a rheumatologist. Yeah, so the yeah. situation's situation's pretty bad. Um, now, when they go and see the rheumatologist, the rheumatologist, and if I can speak in broad general terms, does not recommend any dietary changes, nor believes in any dietary changes, and in fact can get quite offended when dietary changes are discussed because they have uh, not read about any improvements in the scientific literature from people making dietary changes with their with their outcome for the disease, and nor have they seen many patients come back and make tremendous improvements from dietary changes. But in the first instance, with regards to the medical literature, there are studies that show the improvements that can be made, and um, although I feel there's still room to be move, room to move in that area because mm-hmm. a lot of the studies were on a small scale. Yeah. They're, they're, they're just hidden amongst thousands of studies about drugs and you just can't find them. Um, but secondly, the studies, I don't believe a study has been done on the ultimate way forward with this disease. And all of the uh, specifics that I've included in the program that I get people on and, and I have had a stop-start almost uh, trial done on on our program and it didn't eventuate because a key person moved into a into the corporate world and out of the research field. Um, and uh, but it, but we're looking at, at at continuing that path and trying to get it done uh, in the future because I think that we can um, we can demonstrate through clinical trials how much can be done and we can try and get the word out there more. But even right now there is. Um, you know, enough to, to, to uh, you would think, for rheumatologists to recommend um, at, least a, uh, at least a basic dietary change to everyone, but it doesn't happen, and in fact, it's no. discouraged. This is what I really can't understand. Aside from the fact that they may not favour certain dietary factors, like, for instance, what we'll talk about your approach today, mm-hmm. apart from that, they should at least be aware of the dangers of poor dietary choices like trans fats, lots of high sugar foods and, you know, refined carbohydrates, because these are known pro inflammatory agents. That's well, not that, there's so. no question of that. You would think so. Yeah. But I can tell you with one hundred percent of an educated comment from hundreds of people giving me feedback from hundreds of rheumatologists conversations around the world. They don't even suggest wow. that. They're not even at the at the Jamie Oliver level of let's reduce sugar. They're not even at that level. They're just it doesn't matter. Wow. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. Yeah, that's crazy. Now there are a sprinkling, a tiny fraction of the rheumatologists who do know the basics, like you know, you've just described, or not even as much as you've just described from, from your educated comments, but just from a, a they have a layman's view on diet the same as anyone else. Mm. So they might say, oh, you might want to cut out you know, a little bit of your fast foods and stuff, but honestly, I rarely hear that. It's just no changes are required wow. to diet. Yeah, we'll do mm-hmm. it all with drugs, and yet they admit yeah. that it's poorly controlled. So yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's, that's right. They should... like. It, this is the thing that I, that gets my mind. Is say if, given that you've got nothing to offer your patients, or, or that you know the things that you have to offer your patients aren't even satisfying your clinical judgment, your clinical satisfaction, mm-hmm. doesn't it seem medically reasonable to investigate something that might have some chance of of some success? But yeah. I, I I would certainly urge everybody who has a diagnosis of RA, indeed any practitioner who is treating any rheumatoid arthritis patients or look managing um, them, to look and read and watch um, the movie that you've got on the story on your site. That's the Patterson um, Program.com, so P-A-D-D-I-S-O-N-P-R-O-G-R-A-M.com, where you quite humorously, I've got to say, you talk about your story because it's, it's a very good talk on there. 
But this is where you detail at least partly the program which you devised. Can you mm. take our listeners through some of this, please, Clint? Because it's it's really quite inspiring. Well, it came about through two different ways. It came about through my my absolute insatiable hunger for knowledge, both through my own experimental um, experimental self guinea pig styles, and it also came about through my my thirst for the uh, scientific literature results on this. So, as I said, I studied it like a, a university degree, and I put myself through all the tests that I had read about online uh, that, that worked. I had a distinct discovery one time where I ate a bunch of cherries after I was experimenting with my diet. I'd found a couple of books online from only two people in the world in 2006, 2007 had said that they had eliminated all of their inflammation and drugs from rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, I read both of them and both of them had made massive changes in diet. And so I'm like, okay, but I implemented both of their different strategies at different times and, and quite, quite bad results, to be honest. So when I started uh, doing these changes, I was eating a lot of cherries. You know, the, the layman knows that or thinks that cherry is good for arthritis. Yep, yeah, with gout true, anyway. But yeah, yeah. So I'm doing this one time, and I got a violent food poisoning reaction because they weren't washed, and I'd eaten them straight off, uh, straight out of the supermarket without washing my hands and without washing the cherries, and they'd been imported from the United States. Now. My pain went away completely after vomiting and having diarrhea for 24 hours. Now, I don't mean I had a pain reduction. I mean I was, in adverted commas, cured. I mean, gone. Now, when I tell this story in front of groups of people with RA, like support groups and stuff, I see everyone's head nodding. We all know this experience because people find that when they don't eat, the pain goes away. And sure enough, I was able to locate some studies online that showed that if you take, in, for instance, in one particular study, 14 patients on a water fast all had rheumatoid arthritis. By the end of the 14 days, all their symptoms was gone. Like they were all back to normal. Like had no disease or symptoms. But then they brought back the food and it didn't seem to matter what food you brought back, all the symptoms came back. Okay, so this leads us into this whole supportive um, uh, state of, of the concept of the leaky gut and, and that the food particles are leaking into the bloodstream. So, you know, a lot of educated practitioners who, who, who treat patients on a daily basis, I, and I've worked with a lot of naturopaths and spoken at a lot of events where naturopaths are the predominant um, audience members. And, it, you know, it doesn't have to be labored that uh, leaky gut is sort of one of the underlying causes for most conditions. And so I know I'm preaching to the converted with that. So we've got particles from the from the food leaking into the blood, then causing a molecular molecular mimicry. The body sees the food proteins as an as an antigen and develops an antibody to that, and then accidentally starts attacking the lining of the joints, which looks very similar to, for instance, cow proteins and things, because of the finite number of ways that you can put together amino acids to create um, animal proteins. And so um, we've got that going on, and then in the, occasionally. People who just, just, I've, I've, these are my own statistics now, but about one in about 20 people when they don't eat, they do not improve. Right. And what's happening with these one in 20 people is that the, the lining of the bacteria, the bacterial overgrowth in their gut is all, so the bacteria is also leaking into the bloodstream in the absence of food. And it is the proteins in the bacteria that are also triggering the uh, molecular mimicry so that the body's creating an antibody to the bacteria that's leaking in it because there's a bacterial overgrowth, there's all the bacteria going in. So these people are harder to treat because their body is so, it's got such severe leaky gut that even in that fasting state, their own gut bacteria is leaking in their blood and causing a, a response. So, but regardless of whether case A, which is like, 95% of people, or case B, you've still got the same underlying cause. Now, this, this um, you know, you talk about bacteria, and this concept of bacterial priming, if you like, for rheumatoid arthritis, I think, um, I think it was Proteus, um, versus another arthralgia called uh, ankylosing spondylitis. There's a professor in England, Professor Alan Ebringer, who's done some very interesting work looking at bacterial overgrowth and a cross-reactivity with um, human leukocyte antigen. 
Now, what he talks about, what he espouses to, is that Klebsiella basically has a cross-reactivity with ankylosing spondylitis. And I'm pretty sure it was Proteus um, species have a cross-reactivity with rheumatoid arthritis. Some researchers say that it's a broader array of, um, you know, um, bacteria and, and other bugs that, that they cross-react with. But anyway, mm. it's a little bit juxtaposed in that Alan Ebringer says get these um, teenagers usually with ankylosing spondylitis. He said get them off the carbs. Now, admittedly, it's processed yep. carbs. And yep. he said, and, and he also espouses the use of antibiotics, but he said get them off, off the carbs onto the higher protein. Whereas you're talking about plant food. You're talking about getting them off all of the meat sort of, um, call them substrates for these um, bacteria. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yep. And let's now really hit bullseye on how people can help people with yeah. rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. So here's the thing, and it took me a long time to work this out, but this is extremely well supported in not just animal studies, but human studies. And I can put all of these in the show notes for this episode uh, so you can, you can have your practitioners log in and, and get all the references and, and validate all of this. Wonderful. The problem is Great. fat. The problem is fat. Now, fat, quite simply, causes intestinal inflammation. Fat causes inflammation. There's about seven animal studies, rats, mice sort of stuff that, that demonstrate this. And there are human studies that demonstrate this as well. Um, and it's a, and it, it, is, it is the medium chain fatty acids, uh, things like vegetable fats, dairy products, that really start to aggravate the inflammation in the gut. And then there is a 100% reliable link that when there is inflammation in the gut, there is leaky gut. It yeah. just goes from one thing to the next. So we've got to avoid inflaming the gut. Now, you bring up ankylosing spondylitis, and I've only recently brought, been brought to my attention the study that you mentioned by someone with ankylosing spondylitis recently because, obviously, um, you know, having had rheumatoid, I spend 99.9% of my time helping people specifically with rheumatoid. Yeah. But we do get an uptake of people following our program with the other psoriasis, lupus, and your ankylosing spondylitis and your sciatic arthritis and the, the big spectrum of other inflammatory autoimmune diseases. So I, I, get a, I get feedback from them. But the ankylosing spondylitis, I must say, is the least uh, uh, sort of... Uh, users of, of our program, and so I have the least data on that. However, um, I do feel that all of them tend to have the same underlying cause, and it would surprise me that um, the treatment for one does not improve it, the conditions for another, given that with the exception of only a few, ankylosing spondylitis is one of them just to lack of, lack of users, um, but certainly all the others I mentioned I have uh, had very, very good feedback from, from people. So let's just go into this. So the problem is fat, and it took me years to work out that, well, first, first of all, how do, how do I try and summarize this in, in a few minutes? So um, we know that fat causes leaky gut. Now, even lean chicken breast, where it looks like there is no fat on the chicken breast, the fat is in the muscle cells. You're still talking about yep. 30% of calories from a lean chicken breast are coming from fat, the yep. calorie content, okay? Yep. So you, you cannot eat meat. All animal products in general, including you know dairy products, cheeses and, and milks and, and yogurts, without having too much fat in the diet to avoid further inflaming someone with an incredibly inflamed body. So if you've got a tiny, tiny spark of a flame or just a simmering of inflammation in the body with rheumatoid arthritis, and that would be your best case, mm. and then you add a pro-inflammatory substance like fat, it's like just adding some kindling to a small fire and it begins to escalate. Right. In doing so, you then start to get the cascade effect of inflammation creating leaky gut. You've got more leaky gut, so more of the proteins are causing more of the attack on the joint, and then you've got more inflammation. So it's a very, very delicate little smoldering of, of fire that's always happening that you have to try and minimize. So... This brings us to a, a, a plant-based diet, which uh, therefore eliminates the major sources of fat in our diet, with the exception of some things like um, some avocados and, and um, olives, which, by the way, have to go as well. Oh, really? For a period of time, because absolutely, yeah, it needs right. to be not just plant-based, because 
there are people around the world right now who may be listening to this who see the title rheumatoid arthritis natural treatments or see my name and listen to this who might be on a plant-based diet and not not keeping their condition completely at bay because it needs to go beyond that. It needs to be low-fat plant-based diet. And then here we can dovetail nicely in with the, with the uh, ankylosing spondylitis study. You've got to get rid of the refined sugars because he's absolutely right that um, you know, simple sugars will stir up uh, rheumatoid arthritis. And because absolutely. there are the gut bacteria, which is one of the factors of the underlying cause, is an overgrowth of, uh, of, of pathogenic bacteria, are feeding on the simple sugars. And so some people find that even fruits will upset them, whilst others find that fruits they can tolerate easy. Um, uh, but everyone struggles with the fat. So fat is an absolute throwing fuel on the fire. But we also, they also need to only eat adequate amounts of protein because excess protein also ends up worsening the symptoms because it gets into the bloodstream and creating uh, a, a more uh, molecular mimicry. So the way that I explain the cause of the problem, and then I'll tell you about my precise treatment, if you like, hmm. The cause of the problem, I explain in a in a six a six component acronym of blame with two A's. So it's bacteria, which is bacterial overgrowth, leaky gut, which we've already covered nicely, um, acidosis. So this is a systemic over acid body by consuming Western foods for too long and taking pharmaceutical medicines and living a stressed life, all of which will contribute to having a lower pH or a higher acid level in the fluids of the body outside of the blood. And that particular state also there in turn encourages the wrong bacteria in the intestines because yep. they're higher. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then the second A in the blame is acid in terms of gastric acid. So people with rheumatoid arthritis have been shown to have low stomach acid. So in habit, when you have low stomach acid, you don't break down your proteins. And when you've got incompletely broken down proteins, that are getting into the gut, and then you've got, and then you've got these, uh, this uh, intestinal permeability, then they're in, uh, ending up in the bloodstream. So mm-hmm. you've got to increase your stomach acid. Mucosal lining, the protective, protective mucus around the inside of the uh, inside of the lumen of the intestine, there's the depleted mucosal lining, meaning that people are malnutrition, mal, malnourished, which has also been shown in scientific literature. People with rheumatoid arthritis are generally malnourished Absolutely. because they've lost the like uh, the mucosal lining, and finally enzymes because we've all eaten such so many cooked foods and our ability to break down foods with the little scissors, the little enzymes, uh, is also um, depleted. And so we need to bring them back up too to help break down in particular our protein. So all these things are going on and so much needs to be done. So specifically to try and stop this um, little flame that's always going to burning off into a big bonfire and we have to get everything right to keep it at an absolute minimum so that the gut can heal just like a cut on the outside of your body can slowly heal but it takes a long time so we have to keep this little smolder as little as we can for as long as we can. So when you're talking about any fat being the kindling for the smoldering fire, and you're saying that, you know, at, at least in the initial phases, you have to avoid avocado and olive oil, which have their own health benefits, we know, in somebody who doesn't have rheumatoid arthritis. Absolutely, yep. So once you've done this initial phase of really getting back to basics and, and doing the raw food diet, I should expound on that, raw plant food diet, how long do you have to do that for and what are the long-term ramifications for food choices? Can you start to sneak in some of these things and, and manage it, or do you have to be 100% strict? Yeah. Well, let me just um, let me get real clear for people if they're wanting to, to um, talk about this with patients or they're thinking about doing this themselves. So I, I, um, I did eight months of a raw food, plant-based diet, Giving, getting most of my calories from uh, soaked nuts and soaked seeds so that they're uh, activated in terms of their uh, enzyme content and easier to digest for a lot of reasons. But the program that I have uh, when you know I bring people to a starting point is actually beyond that because that is too hard to recommend. You just, you just don't recommend 
someone do something that's that difficult if you're hoping to support them and to get a uh, get any kind of compliance for a period of time. So the program that I have starts on cooked foods and raw foods, a ah. mixture of the two. Ah, the right. raw foods that I recommend, uh, the, the, the raw component, most importantly, are the leafy greens because the bacteria need to have fiber to thrive. So healthy bacteria love leafy greens. And so uh, in the most consistent healing food that anyone with inflammatory arthritis can eat are leafy greens. So yeah. I'm talking bok choy and romaine lettuce and anything that's, a, that's green and grew, any kind of herbs and these sort of things, Any anything that's green and grew in the ground is, is going to uh, <laughs> give you good G word. Yeah. Um, so... Um, so there's tons and tons of greens, and then we emphasize easy to digest, alkalizing, so anti-acidosis foods that are easy to digest, and that and most of the, and and those foods that I found over years of experimentation helpful, uh, buckwheat, which of course isn't actually a wheat, does not contain gluten, has just an, an atrocious name, a misleading name. It's actually a seed, just like the other food that I recommend people eat a lot, which is quinoa. So quinoa and buckwheat are very anti-inflammatory, easy-to-digest foods for most people. And they are a great platform, those two foods, for the first 12 days, along with sweet potato, uh, along with uh, lots of seaweed because of the dense mineral content and therefore further alkalizing effects. Um, and also, um, I do encourage uh, people to have uh, garlic as an antimicrobial, uh, onions, which is the highest uh, dense uh, source of quercetin, good for the tight junctions in the gut, and miso paste, which is a probiotic food, obviously from the originally from the Japanese, which is just uh, uh, adds flavour to these otherwise fairly humble, simple meals, and gets you through the first twelve days. And from there, it's about reintroducing foods one at a time over a period of one to two days per food. So it's not a quick process; it'll take a take a month or two. And in that time period, people are uh, finding out what they're reacting to. Now, I've made recommendations and, and, and have, a, have a, a, a step-by-step guide as to the foods that I recommend in specific order. Yep. But it's not the same for everyone. Some people, as we talked about earlier, respond terribly to the sugars in fruit, so they need to put fruits aside for a while, whilst others... Um, find that the protein, higher protein foods are really uh, challenging. And so, Jen, I try and sidestep both of those um, uh, for, for a period of time after the first 12 days and, and beyond. And meanwhile, I forgot to mention as well, people are drinking celery and cucumber juice. So no sugar, just this juice of celery and cucumber, which is cooling, alkalizing, uh, and uh, has excellent anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, effects. And so I you know, get a lot of people saying that all they do you know, a lot of people listen to my free information and, and don't end up uh, doing the program in full, but just say that they've just uh, started doing selling cucumber juices between meals, and that alone has helped them to not have to take wow. something like their daily non steroidal anti inflammatory drug or something like that, which is fabulous. So, for our Australian practitioners, if you log on to fxmedicine.com.au and put in your details there, we'll have this information on the Patterson program for you to link to, and then you can join up to that program. Because I think this stuff is critical, Clint. Seriously, this is really awesome. So- I'm not disillusioned to have the feeling that one day this could quite potentially be the co-treatment to the pharmaceutical approach yeah. that's currently used. So um, I know that in Australia, the FODMAPs is often used with uh, naturopaths uh, when they say, oh, we'll do all of these changes with regards to your supplementation and avoid this or do that. And, 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 and it kind of just doesn't get questioned enough. Mm. It, it just, there are some standards that are in place from a dietary point of view that that um, if I can be so bold to say that naturopaths are happy just to, to, to let, that, let that sleeping dog lie. But I challenge anyone who's treating someone with rheumatoid arthritis to replace the dietary approach that you're currently using with them and get them to go and do this program. And I will fall off my chair if that patient doesn't come back in a week or two weeks and say that they have not only improved but improved dramatically. And it's the sort of thing that can completely reinvigorate a person with this disease with their feeling of hope for the future um, and and what's possible because the results are astounding and it can be achieved within just a couple of days because mm. just by putting olive oil on salad on a daily routine 
can totally keep people in the inflamed state at a level that then continues to promote the leaky gut and they just never get out of the cycle. So you need to get everything right and, uh, and I just hope that uh, people are, uh, um, you know, open-minded and, uh, and entrepreneurial enough to, um, to, to encourage this because the results speak for themselves. Yeah. So, so the thing that I noticed there is that you were using activated suts and nuts and seeds as well as mm. buckwheat and quinoa. So does that give you your complete protein so you're not missing out on any essential amino acids? It would, wouldn't yeah, it? So Quinoa and buckwheat are both complete proteins. So that's one of the great things about them is that there's no no uh, amino acids missing at all. So yeah. you can actually, uh, you don't, you know, you could just live off quinoa alone from an amino acid point of view. Um, and with regards to the soaked nuts and seeds, um, I, um, yeah, I kind of ask people to reintroduce them later uh, with this sort of gotcha. with the with the program that I that I put together for others. I use them in the early stages, but it's it's something that I find. Oh. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to emphasize after the first 12 days for people to start to get back onto very useful foods, yep. things like potatoes, and try to be able to eat some brown rice or some even some basmati rice, things that make their day-to-day desire for satiation fairly easy. So that if, and, and, and given that they're only doing maybe a couple of foods a week, three or four different foods at the most a week, um, I, I, I want to postpone some of the more uh, less conventional things like the soaked nuts and seeds just because it doesn't look good in the workplace when yeah. they show up and they're eating yeah. that, that sort of stuff. Yeah. I want them to get onto useful things quickly. The the funny thing is I'm looking at some of that and I'm actually salivating. Like, you know, like, <laughs> see, cucumber and celery juice to me is like yum. I, um, miso paste, oh, my goodness. But anyway. Well, that's um, right. well that, what that tells me is that your signals from your gut bacteria that are influencing you through the gut-brain axis is, and creating – desires for those foods to self-perpetuate those healthy foods. So mm. that tells me right off the bat that you have a healthy gut bacteria and you have a healthy diet. I've got Japanese bugs. No, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's right. You're overgrown with Japanese yeah. bugs. <laughs> so I, I have to ask, though, when you've got people that are used to a, a standard Australian diet, that is sad, mm-hmm. how do you yeah. get them? I mean, obviously they're in desperation, but how do you get people to, A, change, but more importantly to stay changed? How do you get them to to remain motivated on, a, you know, which would seem quite a sort of alien diet to a lot of Australians? Yeah, so you've nailed it with the word, uh, you know, highly motivated or the phrase, you know, in pain, determined. I mean, when people hit a bad enough situation, they're willing to make changes. You know, it's like when, to, to take it to a whole new extreme, it's like when, you know, you see the documentaries and stuff when people, the plane crashes in the snow and there's nothing else, to, no way to survive except to eat the dead person. I mean, it, it yeah. gets to a point where you're in that much pain where you'll literally do anything. Right. And um, I would certainly... Uh, you know, say that, that this program isn't anywhere near that kind of stretch. And some people report that they really enjoy these foods after the first one or two days. So the, the foods themselves are just humble foods. They're not unpleasant. They're not, they're just not covered in cheese and oil. They're yeah. not on a bloody, you know, crisp bread piece of highly processed flour. These are foods that are wholesome and designed to heal and nourish the body. So the first thing is getting them onto it it is not uh, not the hardest sell when they're willing to try anything and the drugs are killing them and the yeah. pain is killing them. Um, and so keeping them on it, um, it, it is partially because the results help build momentum and enthusiasm and um, determination. So when people see that they, they can now create a fist or if people can now put on a, a wedding ring they haven't worn in years or they can now walk up and down the stairs or open the jar or turn on the tap, when they start to do these things, they feel elated and it's a situation where um, the good feeling drives more effort. Yeah. So so that's one part of it. But then there are that, that there is another part of it where I've set up another uh, unit to what I offer for people in this situation, which I've set up an online community because I was yeah. seeing people dropping out, not not having any support, their husband and wife or uh, their children are not interested in eating healthy because they either uh, you know don't believe it'll work or they just just too they, they don't to have their, the impetus. Yeah, uh, if, if they, they don't, don't have, have RA, the that... exactly, yeah. exactly, and so. I've set up an online community that my uh, 
clients have access to, um, in which I also coach people. So I'm active in there every day, and and it's like an online Facebook, but it's a private uh, where everyone's privacy is protected yep. and people can talk openly about their condition. And there's been three different studies that have been uh, conducted on people with RA that show that talking about, writing about, and having a social support around all around our rheumatoid arthritis, all in separate studies, have shown clinical improvements in those people who've had those uh, that, that, that situation. So they need to write about, talk about, and have people to listen to them about their disease and their problems, and it all helps clinical outcomes. And that's why uh, I set this up, is to help people get better results and also help people to stay on it. So that's the way that I offer for people who are struggling, and then everyone else uh, don't need that because they're just motivated by their results. Yeah. I, I think as an, as an addendum to, you know, maybe ask, plead, with any rheumatologist or, or anybody treating rheumatoid arthritis sufferers, that looking at some of those foods that you used, none of those are nutritionally deficit. And that even if you had these people on those foods for two weeks, it's certainly got not going to cause an issue. Like somebody's got to be hospitalized before you would be avoiding any of these foods. I mean, they've seriously got to be, they'd have to be in renal shutdown. Um, well, that's right. So yeah. these foods are safe for everybody. And, and so even if you just give it two weeks and then let, let the proof be in the pudding, pun mm-hmm. not intended, forgive me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but even if you did that, then you can at least make an objective assessment rather than looking at the absolutely atrocious dietary research that was done on rheumatoid arthritis. I looked at a couple of it, a couple of the things, and that you know they basically regressed it down to sodium and they found no significance. It was, it was it was ridiculous. So, yeah. you know, when if a rheumatologist is going to be assessing diet, don't assess this one as diet because it's different. Mm-hmm. And that, and that's why I, I remember, you know, we, we've had a great conversation. It's gone fast. I remember when we were talking about it right at the start. Um, I talked about how rheumatologists don't tend to see people come back in and get any improvement from their dietary changes because they're going out and they're doing things like the paleo diet or they're going out and they're just deciding to eliminate nightshade vegetables or yeah. what they're doing is they say, let's do the Mediterranean diet. And they're all doing these various things that are fundamentally shackled, fundamentally flawed. One of the greatest dietary aggravators reported in the literature of a study of the last 10 years is meat. How can you possibly go out and do a paleo autoimmune process that involves meat in the diet and ever get off all your drugs, get rid of all your pain and be able to slowly reintroduce other foods and expect to have somewhat of a normal life again. It just doesn't work. That's why people on paleo diet and these other diets that I mentioned come to me and they say, I've tried these things, I got worse and here I am. Now, some of them improve quickly at the start because we all know if we're involved with helping people with inflammation that you eliminate dairy products and everyone improves from yep. everything. Yep. Yep. Like you take dairy out of the picture and the whole world would be 50% healthier overnight. However, um, once you take dairy out and, uh, and take oils out in the case of some of these diets, um, but if you retain one of the greatest aggravators, you just will never finally get it fully under control. And mm. so... Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think the I think one of the things is people people associate the, a healthy diet with something that you can use in a clini- clinical diagnosis of something like rheumatoid arthritis, and that may not be the case. You know, like uh, a Mediterranean diet is certainly well um, researched with cardiovascular disease, but that's not mm-hmm. an autoimmune condition that involves rheumatoid arthritis and destruction of joints. You've got no, a, a right. totally different um, p- pathology going on. So mm-hmm. a quote-unquote healthy diet is not necessarily a rheumatoid arthritis healthy diet. No, because just to, just to really emphasize that point, there's the studies that have done on people with rheumatoid arthritis in terms of their actual what's going on at a molecular level inside mm. the gut, inside mm. their intestines. People with uh, intestinal disorders don't even have the degree of destruction of the gut wall that people with RA yeah. have. Yeah. People with RA are at the absolute extreme end of dysbiosis of of, of chronic chronic intestinal disorder. Yep. It's like 
uh, as bad as it can get. So it's not a joint tried, disease. <laughs> yeah, no, you've, you've got one hell of a problem in your gut and your joints are taking the brunt of the uh, consequences of that. But um, uh, someone who's trying to uh, improve their likelihood of, of not having a cardiovascular event um, uh, do not need to go to the same extremes that someone who has an absolute uh, shambles of a digestive system like in the case of rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah, that's right. So I've got to ask because the testimonials on the pattersonprogram.com are glowing. And, and, and you know, sceptics or detractors might say, oh, well, they're the, the converts. So I've got to ask the other end of the question. They're the ones who got really great relief early on. What's the worst result that you got from using the Patterson program? So I don't know that there's anyone who hasn't improved, but people, there are some people who come around every now and then, and I have a lot of clients now. We're up around the 7,000 mark around the world, and of which I communicate with a lot of people in our online community on a regular basis. So I get feedback constantly mm -hmm. about uh, people's uh, response to this program. Yep. And the people, and this is interesting, I'm, I'm really glad you asked this, it's not how long you've had the disease that indicates how well you'll respond to this. And it's not how bad your diet was leading up to eating, to changing your uh, diet and starting the Patterson program. Uh -huh. It is what drugs you've been taking prior to starting that is the greatest indicator to how well you will improve. People who have been on pregnazone for several years or people who've been taking long-term antibiotics or, in the most common instance, people who are taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs on a regular basis to keep their pain low are the most difficult people to heal. It's because... Uh, gut. pretty straightforward here. <laughs> Pregnazone causes leaky gut. It depletes the mucosal lining, exposing the epithelium to all of the food particles as they pass through it. The antibiotics are like a nuclear bomb on all of the civilians in the uh, in the gut. And your non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are absolutely atrocious in terms of creating gut inflammation and in terms of creating leaky gut. And when you combine non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs with pregnazone, you get a twofold effect in leaky gut, and lots of people are doing this. And so the hardest people to heal are the people on the wrong medication. Yeah. So I mean, Isn't it tragic? Yeah, absolutely. And you look at the prevalence of antibiotics, NSAIDs, prednisone. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. look, at, look at antibiotics, NSAIDs. <laughs> prednisone yeah. obviously is controlled, but... but um, antibiotics is a travesty. We're finding this is actually a clinical issue now um, where mm -hmm. antibiotic resistance is not a going to be. It's not a, a climate control that, you know, we have to look to in the future. It's here. It's now. It's been and done. Right. NSAIDs, though, over the counter, my goodness, like the abuse of NSAIDs as a quote-unquote safe therapy, and especially in yep. children, you've got to be kidding me. I'm, I'm just waiting. Agree. I'm just waiting. Uh, yep. Until yeah. we see these uh, teenagers with bleeding ulcers, I'm mm -hmm. waiting. Anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> don't get yeah. me started yeah. on that one. Oh, Clint, yeah. I, I got to yeah. say, like, the, I could go on and on because this is really interesting to me, and, and I've got to say, it's quite controversial for me because there was these things you said olive oil, and I'm going what? You know, mm -hmm. Professor Les Cleland at Adelaide Hospital, Royal Adelaide Hospital, did his um, research with um, fish oil as being safe mm -hmm. with standard rheumatoid arthritis treatment. Mm -hmm. But I do yeah, admit so. that this is with standard rheumatoid arthritis treatment and standard rheumatoid arthritis results. Yeah, well, let, let me comment on fish oils. And my comment on fish oils is not as pointed as what uh, I have uh, with everything else. And it's because I never um, had close experience with them for very long myself yeah. and because none of my clients take them I don't get much feedback on them if any now the thing with the fish oils is that let's say for instance that they provide some temporary pain relief on rheumatoid arthritis and I think that um, it's fair to say that the, the majority of the scientific literature supports that let's say that that's the case now what that does is create a wonderful industry for people supplying fish oils and a pathetic outcome for people who are taking them yeah. because 
all you're doing is just using a different way of pain trying relief. to get some pain relief That's and right. not addressing the underlying cause. And in the meantime, we're destroying the world's oceans and supplies of fish by out there trying to collect the fish for this for this purpose. And I went to a talk recently, uh, with, um, only within the last two months, that said this year off the coast of Chile uh, in South America that for the first time ever there is no allowed fishing for fish oil, uh, yeah. fish because they've depleted this ocean so much that it's now at risk of extinction. So of those particular fish. Yeah. And I, you know, I think, listen, if you've got rheumatoid arthritis or you're treating someone with RA, stop putting Band-Aids on something that will just keep bursting the Band-Aids he, every he. day. You've got to get to the cause. He, he. Uh, mm. that's, that's naturopathy, was always to look at the cause. So yeah. uh, I have to then ask, are there any supplements which are accepted or safe, in, indeed, which you might use? Yeah, yeah, and I love some of them, and I tell people to pop them like candy. Now that's a that's my that's a non practitioner <laughs> phrase um, because I'm, I'm obviously uh, please see your practitioner for dosage. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> um, and of course, anyone listening to this can can probably tell the way that I, I uh, the way that I I speak, and I'm, I'm very forthcoming with my opinion. I've got no. Um, you know, medical background or medical training or naturopathic uh, education. I'm just telling it from experience and yep. from results and working with others. So obviously, uh, get it get it from a professional yep. because I'm not insured. Um, <laughs> so, um, with regards to uh, the supplements, now we talked about having trouble to break down proteins because of our uh, achloridia or lack of hydrochloric acid in the stomach with people with RA. Bromelain was an excellent supplement for me to take in very high doses. And again, just stick with the dose on the pack unless you want to do your own thing, but I'm not suggesting you do what I did. I just did this for my own personal use. I took high dose of bromelain. Um, and of course, bromelain for, for listeners is, uh, uh, assists in the breakdown of proteins because mm -hmm. we're trying to avoid incompletely digested proteins entering the blood. So we're trying to uh, access uh, more of those amino acids because the amino acids when they pass into the bloodstream are completely harmless and in fact useful um, as opposed to incompletely digested proteins which should not be present in the blood. So bromelain is one and I, uh, I, I recommend that um, wholeheartedly. We, we, we can all agree and pat ourselves on the back that there's no arguments around probiotic supplements. We all should um, encourage probiotic supplements for um, for gut health and I'm always talking about uh, a non-dairy uh, probiotic supplement uh, with a vegetarian capsule so that you've got no animal products present and people ask me often which ones should you take is there specific strains and all this sort of stuff and I think that on this topic we really overthink it and I think the answer to this uh, is always just buy as many probiotics that are on special take them at different <laughs> times different strains yes just Get them into you in vast quantity because the diversity of the bacteria is just as important as the quantity. So let's not get caught up in brands. Let's not get caught up in um, strains. Just do it. Just get into them. And if they cost a lot of money, then get what's on special and get them at the time of the month when your health food store has a discount and, uh, and have them on the shelf, either refrigerated or shelf uh, bacteria, uh, sorry, uh, probiotic, both are good. Just yep. get into them. Get into them. Um, yep, get into them. Um, now, I also like potassium because a study, it's one of the only times when I actually like to do nutrient therapies. You know, but we, we, I like everything's got to be whole food, but nutrient therapy with potassium has proven beneficial in a clinical trial. So it's hard to argue against the only change being done over a 60-day period for people with RA, they just gave them potassium supplements and they gave the other group a, 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 a placebo. And dramatic difference, there was the potassium helped them. And so very hard to argue against that. And one of the thoughts behind that is, again, due to the chronic metabolic acidosis. The people with RA have elevated uh, uh, acids uh, in their body and um, this is a way of bringing that down. Mm -hmm. And it's also supported by another study where... Potassium was included with some other um, minerals, so that it was just one of several, like uh, magnesium, uh, calcium, in a in a in an alkalizing mineral supplement, and they got the same positive results on a group of people with rheumatoid arthritis. So hard not to recommend um, potassium for that reason. Um, in a, in less of a specific supplement, but more of a general 
uh, you know, thing that can be purchased from your naturopath or from the health food store is just, again, alkalizing minerals. And I like these in the form of these ultra greens. So yep. things that are, you know, things like spirulina and uh, uh, all of these uh, mixed greens because all of these greens uh, are just so helpful for um, alkalization. And then also... Um, uh, I, I kind of just for completeness suggest people take a B12 if they are not eating any animal products because we don't eat our foods close to the source. We aren't picking up any soil when we eat our carrots and our potatoes these days. And of course, the bacteria comes, the B12 comes from the soil. And in, back in the day, humans would eat close to the soil. And, yes. and you know, hundred couple hundred years ago, if we were vegan, we would not need to uh, take B12 supplements. But these days, the foods are, are, are well distanced from where they came from. When we lose that bacteria, we lose the soil, things are overly clean. And so yep, yep. B12 for completeness. So look for anti-inflammatory purposes. Some people like to take curcumin, and there is some good results with uh, curcumin for people who, um, who take those. But I would only encourage people to take curcumin if they're trying to transition off a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And the reason I say this is because people will really become fixated on the supplements as their saviour. Yeah. But we really have to shift focus onto the diet and something we haven't even talked about but is so critical as well for RA is exercise. Mm. It's just so important. So I want people to have two things on their mind when they wake up. Heal the gut with the foods and get out there and exercise to substitute the need for pain-killing drugs that day yep. because enough days consecutively without having to take the non-steroidal drugs and substituting it, not just cold turkey, but getting something in place of it in the form of cardiovascular exercise for 30 or more minutes a day above walking, more, I'm talking like getting on a treadmill or going for a swim or going to Bikram yoga, something that really elevates the heart, heart rate, there lies an anti-inflammatory powerhouse yeah that's right so we have to yeah replace those painkillers allow the gut to heal for a few weeks use the exercise and use the diet and you cannot not improve if I, you do these things i couldn't agree with you more i think people need to really read that word called supplement it never says main yeah. amount it's supplement yeah. it's to supplement, supplement yes. what you're doing yes. with the diet um and yes. exercise so Clint, I, I can't thank you enough for taking me through this day and taking us through what you've experienced and, and indeed what you propose today. This is really, really interesting, confronting, controversial, <laughs> absolutely. But heck, you talk about 7,000 people. This oh, is yeah. something that and really needs looking into. It is. And, um, you know, we could, again, I, I've taken up a lot of your time. I, I, I'm not sure how long your normally episodes go for, but I do know we've, we've covered this a lot. This is all good stuff. This is time. great. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I do anticipate because I'm sort of, once I set it as a goal, it will happen. I anticipate that we'll do a trial on this and yeah. I have lots of, uh, lots of support, people in high areas, particularly in the US. I've got lots of close contacts now in the US uh, who are very, very prominent plant-based doctors and rheumatologists and things who are very interested in this. Um, and then... Um, I, I do hope also that we can just uh, – I want to put forward to, to rheumatologists a, a guide that I've been working on recently, which uh, I hope to disseminate to all of my my Patterson programmers around the world because they all want to get into their little hands the evidence that supports what they're doing so that we, as a ground, as a grassroots group, educate the, the, the medical professionals. And I think that's, that's a real possibility. I mean, yeah. I've got – yeah, I got a lot of supporters who are who are really passionate about helping me help spread this word, and it's because when people have lives improved, they feel indebted to help spread the word to others or to help. You know, it's the reciprocity sort of situation, and and so I hope to be able to continue to empower people to educate their doctors, and that's what needs to happen. And um, I, I'm always got my hand up to speak at events where rheumatologists and doctors are at, and I am happy to engage in any level of conversation, in any format, on any medium, um, with people who are in the, uh, uh, any kind of profession and defend this to the core because without, you know, without going through this, you can be a little bit intimidated, mm. but uh, having been through it, 
and 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 then also witness so many others uh, have these uh, similar responses, you get an extreme level of confidence and and. You know, I've got nothing to hide, only everything to share. You know? Yeah, yeah. And well done, I've got to say, I, like I doff my hat at, um, to, to you. That it's, just, it's so brave of you. But not just for you and not just talking about it, it's really what you've done for other people. It's really what you've done to these people who, um, they really do suffer from rheumatoid. When we were able to get my blood test back and I, was, I got off the methotrexate and uh, there was still a lot of healing to be done with regards to my knee joint. It took a long time to, to build strength back up in the knee and a lot of things. But Melissa said, if we can only help one person by documenting everything that we can into a way that we could share with others, then it will be worth it. So that's what we did. I took all the, all the lessons I learned and all the science that I had, had used to, to justify the decisions I made and I put it all together. And that's where the Patterson Program began. And um, yeah, it's, it's just grown from there. And well, so so we've just been well, trying to support it. I tell you what, any medico could argue an N equals 2 study as being underpowered. It's very hard mm-hmm. to argue 7,000. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. I would implore, I would urge all practitioners to look into the thepattersonprogram.com. Can't thank you enough for joining us on FX Medicine today, Clint. Well done. I look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Thanks so much for having me. It's a great pleasure. I appreciate it. This is FX Medicine, and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. This podcast was proudly brought to you by the Bioceutical Seminar Series, Reprogramming Autoimmunity.